Hello again. Here I am from my house once again and fully caffeinated right now. Uh, I just want to bring you uh, one main battle. Uh, and I might move into Saipan a little bit, but Arawa. Um, in fact, this is the book right here I'd recommend. Uh, it's by Bob Sherrod, uh, Robert Sherrod. He was a reporter uh, that went in to Tarawa with the 2nd Marine Division, a uh, division my dad was part of. This is why this book's very personal to me, and this battle's very personal to me. Um, my theme, I guess, today, one thought is, and, and it works with the current situation now, is get off the beach. Um, when you look at Tarawa, uh, there's three things. There's the, there's the, uh, oh, the output, the odds, and the outcome. Uh, and when you look at it, the first thing about Taro is this small little set of chain of island, an island amongst these chains in the Gilbert Islands out in the Pacific. And I'm going to try to upload a map and we'll see how well that goes. If not, then, you know, kids, I'll tell you where you can go find it or you can Google it. You know, it's not a problem. Uh, and uh, first thing with the output uh, is this is the time when you really see the American war machine cranking up. And this is in late 1943. Uh, we last, last, last left off with the Pacific or the Atlantic theater, the European theater, with what was going on in the Italian campaign. Now we're going to shift to the Pacific with Parawa. And um, what you see in this case is the American output, uh, the large numbers of vessels that have been created. This is a mammoth, mammoth uh, naval operation as well uh, of the Navy just sweeping across the Pacific in a huge amount. And it's on display. The naval bombardment's on display and the Marines are going to use the LVTs, the landing vehicles, um, that it's also going to create a problem and a wonderful lesson. Uh, so the output is on display. So the U.S. factories play a major role. This connects us back to the home front. Who's going into the factories? A huge segment of the women's population. Uh, African-Americans are being recruited to go in there as well. Uh, there's a host of things. You have your packet you can read. Um, and, and the other thing with the output also I want to point out is the word, the code breaking. Now, when we think of military, we think of uh, the soldier, okay, we think of the infantry, but you have to remember in the U.S. military, with the U.S. military, there's different jobs and occupations that are extremely important, uh, and it all comes together as an integrated unit. And when you think of this, code breaking is really, really critical with this, because the Americans had broken Japanese codes, and they could read them, and the Japanese were sending uh, tremendous amounts of, of supplies for construction, and that's where Tarawa really gets set up. Uh, there's this construction uh, of this very fortified island. There's only about 4,700 total on the island by the Japanese. Now, now be careful with those numbers. It's about 3,000 Japanese soldiers. It's about 1,000 construction workers. That's key when you start studying it. So you get the idea of construction and fortifying this area. And then you got uh, some Koreans that are being used as forced labor by the Japanese. Uh, probably close to 1,000 there. Uh, and what happens is the Japanese on the island, uh, the, the admiral that's in control there, uh, Shibakazi, uh, has this incredible boastful uh, statement of it would take a million men and a hundred years to take uh, Tarawa. Um, and uh, what they've done is they constructed this incredible cement barriers. These logs have been put in place. Uh, it's an incredible fortification, machine gun nest. And this is what's waiting for the Marines. Uh, as they begin to move towards uh, Tarawa. Uh, and uh, what's going to happen is this boast by Shibakazi, why the code breaking matters, is because um, the Americans uh, do begin, they, they intercept the codes and they intercept the ship coming in. And so you don't get as many supplies, okay, there. So, excuse me, the fortifications are not to the degree that they could have been. But that's scary enough when you study the battle because the Marines are about to find a horrible, horrible uh, uh, enemy waiting for them that is just entrenched. Um, what they, what the American, what the Americans did is they pull up the naval guns. They, they bombard the beaches, thinking they're taking the, the Japanese out. In fact, on one of the ships, a uh, gentleman, uh, one of the officers turns and says, "No one could have be alive after that bombardment." Well, they're wrong. The Japanese have been sitting there, hunkered down, like we're hunkered down, I guess, waiting. And then all of a sudden, uh, around 0200, uh, right in there, uh, Marines are rise up. They get their steak and eggs. They get this almost kind of a last meal, seemingly. And uh, then they all go into the boats. And it's an amazing array. It's a nice cross-section 
in the Marines when you read about it, of the Americans, uh, of the of the country, cross section. They're farmers and there's people from inner cities and everything else. They're all making up this these groups of folks called the United States Marines. They're a different fighting force is what Sherrod recognizes because he'd been he'd been in with other groups. And so he was very intrigued by who these Marines were. And uh, the second Marine Division is the main division. Uh, you have about 18,000 men uh, and uh, t- about 35,000 total when you get done with the total count. You also have an army, uh, the 27th Army is in with them. Uh, and off they get into these LVTs and they go. And the LVTs, the plan is to take them up to the beach, drop, and then you get out. Uh, the problem is uh, they're, they're a little bit uh, off on this and they hit the sandbars and then uh, all of a sudden they're told, get out. Um, and uh, it's kind of like the taxi cab driver told me in Washington, D.C. when I went to, you got to get out. Here I am in the middle of the traffic. Um, and I kind of, I wasn't as bad though. There were no, no, no machine gun nests and everything. But why that matters is you got to think of the number 700 yards. Tara was about the size of New York City Central Park, by the way, when you look at this and you measure it out, uh, it's about three square mile area. Um, and so it's compact. But it's heavily defended. And the Marines, 700 yards. You guys know football, though we haven't seen it lately. Uh, football, 700 yards. Can you imagine getting out into the water with equipment and you got 700 yards ahead of you and you got machine gun fire just hitting you from every angle you can possibly imagine? This is what's waiting for them on bloody, bloody Tarawa. It's, it's one of the worst campaigns of World War II. And it's a heck of a lesson that they're going to learn. Uh, very priceless. Very priceless, very costly lesson. Uh, and by the way, to, uh, just for my New Mexican uh, folks here, uh, there's a man, if you want to look him up, last name Bonnyman, uh, B-O-N-N-Y-M-A-N. Uh, he was a Princeton grad, class of 32. Uh, he was a New Mexico mine owner, and he was involved with Parwa. Uh, he was killed, unfortunately, uh, at the top of a hill um and uh ended up posthumously receiving the medal of honor if you want to look this up but uh, alfred honor, alfred bonnyman uh from uh, he owned a new mexico mine his family and anyway so uh when you get into this the idea is at the very end this is a 76 hour engagement and marines are just being picked off uh, people read about this there's a little film you could go to the movies and sit in the movie theater and you can see uh, uh the news of the day and there's this little film about the marines at tarawa uh, but the photographs that were taken by people like Sherrod and people like this over there, you just see Marine bodies floating in the water. You see the sacrifice um, of the American people uh, on display there. These are young guys, 19 years old, off the beach, right? Get off the beach with the whole idea to live, to survive. Well, I'm, my message, I guess, is get off the beach um, today because that works with it. Uh, do something for someone else. And uh, the outcome really is at the end of the day, the Marines have about 2,300 casualties. Okay, I was only being total dead, maybe a little over a thousand dead, but it's horrific. Uh, it's a murderous fist fight. The Japanese, by the way, okay, remember we go back to around 4,700. 4, uh, there's 17, 17 Japanese survivors. Now you could say this is because of the Marines' effectiveness and so on. I'd kind of go with you on that. The Marines are learning to really hate the Japanese. You have to pick this up. Uh, one of the main guys that in with Parwa was a man I mentioned very briefly with Guadalcanal. I wish I'd done better on Guadalcanal for it. I apologize. Is is a guy named Merritt Edson. Uh, he was a favorite of the Marines. Um, tough guy, uh, um, uh, short, which I like. Um, but these steely blue eyes, and so when you look at him, you didn't think much of him. But you could look in his eyes and see that he just, you know, he just really had no affinity for the Japanese, because especially Guadalcanal. Uh, the Marines, the more they come into contact with the Japanese, they don't like him. Okay, go back to why 17 survivors. These bonsai charts. These bonsai charges start coming up, and you read them where the Japanese at times they don't have anything. They don't have a they don't have a weapon. They just kind of fashion something. They take a, a knife and they're charging. And it's this mentality that have been taught that, that, that that's been imbued in the Japanese soldier: better to die than surrender. Uh, and so at the end, what is the big lesson with the Marines is the idea of you have to integrate the assault better, and especially with the landing vehicles. Uh, you can't let this happen again. And uh, the next time you really see the big engagement, I'm going I'm to island hop as well as they hop. I'm going to hop you on over to the Marianas Islands to talk about two things. Uh, the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Uh, that's an that's a aircraft main engagement. It was called Turkey Shoot because the United States will shoot down a huge number of Japanese planes uh, in, in total. 
um, uh, around 275 Japanese planes are going to go down, and and, and, and the Americans are going to sink uh, three major aircraft carriers, and this is huge. And also the Marianas Islands, you begin to see the full force. You begin to see this shift in the outproduction, the outproduction by the Americans, the people in the factories, and getting them out. Um, and uh, you begin to see this in the Great Marianas Turkey shoot. Um, and so we'll look at that next time. I'm going to segment it because it's getting a little long. I told you I'd try to keep in small doses like radiation, like Hiroshima in a way as we're heading towards this. And the last thought I want you to think is get off the beach, right? Something an FDR said in a uh, uh, fireside chat, uh, which I highly recommend you watch it uh, or, or listen to them if you don't mind. And FDR's commentary was, we defend and we build a way of life, not for the Americans, but for humanity. And that's what this war is about. World War II is about the war for humanity. It, it is about these two views of the world. Um, the, the view of a totalitarian system, Hitler, the Japanese, okay? I'm using those two mainly. And, and then uh, a fascist design, and then the American design. And the Americans are confronted with these ideas of the practices of democracy. You know, you can, you can say what you want, you can quote, and that's great, but you've got to practice it. And, and you have to treat others with that same respect and dignity. And you have to realize that there is always a sacrifice at home or abroad. And so, you know, this is really, to me, the lesson of this wonderful period of time and how much they suffered and went without and the rationing that went on and so on like this. We could talk about this for days, you know, I could because <laughs> I enjoy it. And I hope you do, too. Um, let me know. Uh, I hope you guys are safe. I hope you're doing what you need to do for heaven's sakes. You know, stay isolated. They talk about it. Um, and, and I think you should. Um, and hopefully, like FDR, we have the freedom from want and the freedom from fear. Uh, and, and I hope you guys enjoy. And I can't wait to see you again. I miss you guys. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.